In this edition, we've got some fantastic layouts to share with you, including some that have been in operation for decades. As for prototypes, we'll take you to some absolutely amazing railroad destinations and explore great equipment from the past and present. And of course, we all strive to add realism and detail to our layouts. So we'll share some secrets and techniques that will help you make your operation look more authentic. And when you see this graphic, pay attention because it tells you the name of a computer file stored on this DVD, including additional details and techniques for creating and improving your layout. Let's get rolling as we bring the action, power, and creativity of model railroading to life in the Dream, Plan, Build video series. Back when I was a boy, my father and brother and I we had Lionel trains, and we really didn't know any better that they weren't scale. Uh, we always tried to make them look as much as possible scale. We uh, weren't really exposed to the HO scale trains. And as time went by, that's what trains look like to me. And now I'm used to the size and the oversized coupler or flange and center rail. It really doesn't bother me. The two railroads are the New York Central and Pensy. New York Central is a small segment of a line that comes down from Syracuse heading uh, southwest and then when it hits this area then it swings back uh, up towards Cleveland. The New York Central is the lower level of the railroad, double track, and it has a town, a small town of Avis. Then uh, the trains head into a large mountain. If you continue on straight through the mountain, uh, you immediately come out and pass over a uh, concrete arch bridge which is the uh, passes over the Lacoming River. From there the trains enter a tunnel which is going to Syracuse. There's a Y that leaves the mountain that heads to, to Survey, a small little town in Pennsylvania. And there we've got a number of structures to, to represent a rural town. The, uh, the tracks are double uh, tracked at this point and the Pensy tracks uh, run into uh, Clearfield and they pass over the uh, west branch of the Susquehanna. The, uh, the Pensy tracks swing around and pass over behind Avis. And then we uh, reach the uh, passing track of uh, Milesburg. Milesburg, another small little rural town in Pennsylvania. When we leave uh, Milesburg, we again hit the single track line heading for Williamsport. Uh, when we reach the uh, outskirts of uh, Williamsport, the, you can see the tracks again, double track. Williamsport is the last uh, town I'm working on in the layout. There's a small amount of it's been finished. I'd like to have something that's finished to, to show the trains against. The uh, power for the trains are run by the Line LZW transformers. The uh, circuits are put full on and then the circuit is wired through a Marnestat throttle that is part of the panel. The other thing I have is rotary switches. There's six uh, throttles or cabs on the layout, but uh, you can run, you can take one cab and run the train any place on the layout by releasing the other cabs to that particular cab. The uh, switch machines are controlled by capacitor discharge, either with the, uh, using a GH push buttons and now uh, the Brawa or German push button. Push buttons are lighted and they show the direction of the trains, the way the tracks or th switches are thrown. I've used uh, grain and wheat bulbs and light emitting diodes for block detection to show where the trains are on the panels. Most of the structures are uh, kit built the, uh, from various manufacturers. A few of the structures are scratch built. The station at Clearfield was uh, scratch built from plans in model railroad. The little eastern shingle cottage at uh, Surveyor was also uh, scratch built. There's over 2,500 shingles on the house, which having to make by hand was quite time consuming, but the, uh, the house did turn out quite nice and uh, it led to the article in uh, Classic Toy Trains. My wife uh, has done all the backdrops. She's worked on it, uh, prodding for me through the years. Uh, as you can see, it really gives a lot of depth to the layout. And she's uh, done all the painting with oil paints, and has most of it done, one area left to do uh, at the back of Williamsport. Up here in Williamsport, uh, I don't have a way of turning the, uh, the double uh, unit diesels, so I plan to have a uh, Y to come off here, connect, and uh, 
then uh, it'll have a false tunnel into the wall. I haven't got too much enthusiasm. Like I told my wife, we could bore a hole underneath the, uh, the entrance to the house, but uh, that's still in negotiation. I've been using digital command control for my HO scale models for years. It wasn't until, oh, very recently that I've decided to attempt to install digital command control decoders in my N scale models. The inherent problem with installing digital command control in N scale locomotives is space. There isn't a heck of a lot. As you can see from my models here, these are very small, and there isn't a lot of room to be putting something, well, something that even looks like this inside. I'm going to show you three different types of N-scale decoders that you can install in your N-scale models, and you'd be surprised at how easy it really is once you get started. The first method of installing a decoder I'll show you today is the drop-in method. A drop-in decoder is designed to replace a locomotive's existing light board. This is an example of a drop-in decoder from train control systems, and it's made to go into an Atlas GP38, which is the locomotive I have here. This is a simple installation. It'll take you less than 10 minutes to do. The first step in installing a drop-in decoder is to remove the shell of the locomotive. Now that I have the shell off the locomotive, we'll take and remove the fuel tank, and also the little black plastic clip here that serves as a view block so that the headlight doesn't shine out the cab windows. We'll loosen the screws and remove one half of the frame so that we can slip the light board out. The screws fit into little plastic nuts that go in the back side of the frame. Don't lose those. The trucks will come off too. Set everything aside. If you're going to be working on a locomotive that you've dis disassembled for a long period of time, it's usually a good idea to have a small box to keep all of the parts in so that you don't accidentally knock things to the floor and have to hunt for them later. All right, with the locomotive ready to disassemble, I'm going to take a screwdriver and slip it in between the frame and gently pry up to pop the tabs that hold the motor mount in place and keep it all together. You should do it. And there we go frame is part. All right, the next step is to slide the light board out and replace it with the new one. Now, you want to make sure that you get the decoder the right side up. On the top of the decoder, you'll notice that there are four little metal tabs here, and those are going to slip into slots inside the frame. The underside of the decoder has two additional metal tabs and those are the connections for the motor. So you need to make sure that those face down towards the motor or your decoder won't work. Before we install the decoder, we need to take and check our motor tabs. These are the contacts that will connect between the decoder and the motor of the locomotive. If they're not lined up properly, your locomotive isn't going to move. The tabs are right here on the top, and you just need to make sure that they are positioned right, and it looks like we're in good shape. So we'll go ahead and install the decoder making sure my motor contacts are face down on the decoder itself so they line up. We'll slip this into the tabs. A new printed circuit board like this is going to be a tight fit because it hasn't been put in before, but you want it to be a tight fit to ensure good electrical conductivity. So let's see if it stays. With that in place, we'll put the second half of the frame on top. With the frame halves back together, now we'll put it on the test track to make sure it works. Something important to do before you put the shell back on the locomotive. All decoders come from the factory program to address three, so that way you know where to start. So I've got my DCC system set to address three. And I'll turn the throttle up. Looks like it works fine. Check the other direction. Good. With that, the drop-in decoder is ready to go. This installation took less than 10 minutes. The next method I'll show you is a wire-in installation. This is a GP9, uh, a regular Atlas locomotive. You take the shell off. You can see that everything inside the shell is pretty much filled with locomotive and frame and lights. There's not a lot of room. Even for a very small decoder, like this Z-scale decoder, if I were to remove the back light board, I still don't have enough room to put the decoder in. 
So in order for this to work, we're going to take and have to make some modifications to the frame. Now you can do this yourself, and I've done it myself before, but it's a lot of work and you stand a good chance to damage the frame to where you can't use it anymore. A company called Aztec Manufacturing will actually take your locomotive frame and they'll do milling work on it to give you room for a decoder. Basically what Aztec does is they mill out this back portion here where the rear headlight would have been so that now we have plenty of room for where our decoder can go. In order to get the frame milled by Aztec, you have to first take apart the locomotive, which involves taking the screws out, pulling the frame halves out, and then shipping the frame to Aztec. The turnaround time is usually about a week. Since we have our frame milled already, let's take and install our decoder. First step is to attach the decoder to the motor itself. Take all these pieces out. This is the motor for our locomotive. We'll be attaching wires to the top and to the bottom brush cap. Now it's important that you take and remove those from the motor first because if you don't, your motor will turn out like this motor where you can see I have already melted the plastic housing that holds the brush cap in place. So you want to avoid that. Pop these guys out with a small screwdriver. Be very careful when you do this because you have the brush itself on the inside and it's held in contact with the motor with a small spring. And if I remove this cap too quickly, the spring and the motor brush will fly around the room. So there we go. You can see we've got our, there's our brush, and there's our spring. The next thing I need to do is take and remove the original brass contact from the brush cap. It's this little bent piece of metal right here. We need to take and slide that off the brush cap. And it's just a matter of using a skinny screwdriver and wiggling it in between to get it to let go. Now that I've got the clips off the brush caps, it's time to take and solder the decoder wires to them. For that, I'm going to bring in my handy workbench vise, and we'll get started. Before I solder the wires on the brush caps, I'm going to apply just a little bit of soldering flux to prepare the surface. This will make the solder adhere faster. I have my soldering iron all heated up already. I'm going to put a little bit of solder on the tip of the iron. And then we're just going to touch it against the cap. We don't want to plug up that hole on the top. All right, with the caps ready, now we'll take and attach the wires. For our DCC decoder installation, attaching the decoder to the motor, we're going to use the orange wire and the gray wire. The orange wire will lead to the bottom part of the motor, and the gray wire will lead to the top. Right now, since the caps are identical, I don't necessarily need to make a distinction, only when I put the motor back together. We'll take and hold our wire in place, bring our soldering iron in, and away it goes. We'll get the gray wire. Maybe. There we go, our brush caps are attached. So the next thing we're going to do is reassemble the motor. Fortunately, I checked the position of the motor in the locomotive before I took it all apart. The motor has a colored magnet on it, and that indicates the orientation of the motor when you put it back. In this particular case, the colored magnet is supposed to go down, and so I know that that is the bottom of my motor, which means that the orange wire brush cap attached will need to go to the bottom side of this motor right here. Put the springs back in. We'll set the brushes very carefully. And I'm just going to use my finger now to hold the whole thing in place so it doesn't fly out while I reinsert it into the motor. Okay. It should just snap motor return to make sure that everything's seated right. So there's one. Let's do the other. Now that the motor and the frame assembly is back together, you can see our decoder hangs out the top here. Our orange and gray wires have plenty of room for the decoder to sit into the open pocket in the back. We've got all these other wires we have to deal with. 
The Aztec frames come with a very handy instruction sheet that gives you not only the dimensions you need to cut the wires to so they fit exactly, but tells you exactly which wires to use in the first place. And from the instruction sheet, we know that we don't need to use the yellow or the blue wire, so I'm just going to take and clip those off, flush with the back of the decoder. Is that one? Next thing we need to do is make the headlight connection. And for that, I have this headlight board here. You can see it has the LED on the bottom. This will be our front headlight. Our front headlight board is going to serve two purposes. It not only takes and connects to the headlight, but it also provides power for the decoder and the motor. So we'll need to make three solder connections to it. According to the Aztec instructions, what I need to do first, though, is separate the original trace, and the trace is just this metal piece that runs right between where it picks up power from the frame and sends it around to the headlight. That's this little metal part right in here. I'm going to have to take and separate that or cut through it so it isolates the headlight and we can wire it to the decoder so it gets independent control. So in order to do that, you simply use a small file and file away on it. I've already prepared this one, but you can see right here, that's where I cut the trace. So now that I've cut the trace, I'll take and put the light board back into the locomotive. It just wedges in like that. And now we have some more wires to solder. Now that I have the soldering done, you can see that we've attached the white wire here for the headlight. We've got the black wire underneath the white wire. Attached to that side for the left side power pickup and the red wire for the right side power pickup. So now we just need to put it on the test track and see if it runs. go and there you go so now that you've seen how to take and do a wire in installation and a drop in installation let me show you an installation that's kind of a combination of both and this includes adding sound to your locomotive this is an MRC sound decoder you can see that it looks just like our drop in installation replacement light board decoder that we used earlier difference is that it has a speaker on it. So we couldn't just drop it into an existing frame because we have nowhere for the speaker to go. That's where Aztec comes back into the story again. This locomotive frame is actually the same as this locomotive frame that we put our drop-in decoder in earlier. The only difference is where this frame has a full weight under the fuel tank, this locomotive frame now has been milled for space for the speaker. With it in place, let's put it on the track and see what it sounds like. You can ring the bell, blow the horn, and send it on its way. Digital command control is a fun and realistic way to operate your model railroad. Thanks to things like small decoders and frame milling services, putting digital command control into N-scale locomotives has never been easier. As always with any project, when you get started, take your time. The first time you install a decoder in an N-scale locomotive will take you a bit, but check your work as you go. Before you know it, you'll be running your railroad with confidence. Only trucks can deliver freight dock to dock and door to door, right? Well, not exactly. See this? It's a truck, isn't it? Well, not exactly. It's a unique hybrid called a road railer trailer. It's half trailer, it's half rail car. Where's the train, you're asking? Well, we'll show you. You see, the road railer is a trailer until it reaches the track. The tractor then drops off the trailer. On go the steel rail wheels, and up go the rubber tires. And what's done is, since our trailers move on bogies rather than flat cars, railroad wheels, our drivers back the trailer onto the, the gauge of the track. They, they use the air from the tractor, and, and special tractors are used within the confines of the yards to do this. The, the tractor uh, airs up the trailer, and the air suspension, which is useful in, in providing a smooth ride over the highway, allows the trailer to actually lift. The driver then backs the trailer onto the rail bogey and releases the air, and, and the trailer settles onto the bogey. The next trailer is done ahead of that. It backs, um, <clears throat> backs into a bogey. The truck pushes the trailer back, and then the link and pin coupling, the, the uh, a tongue essentially on the, on the head of the road railer, 
backs into a pin on the, uh, the trailer in front of it and, and forms a slack-free coupling. So it's done without a lot of the drama you see in conventional intermodal business. There's no cranes. There, there's not a lot of big physical movement around, and there's certainly no cars. But it allows us to have a, a, a confined terminal uh, which operates at low costs and, and puts together slack-free trains. No longer does freight have to be transferred from a train to a truck. The road railer trailer just slides off the rail, hits the road, and the goods can be delivered door to door. The road railer technology has allowed us to carry goods that are very competitive with the trucking industry and tend to be the things that the railroads have lost their market share of a long time ago. Our, our primary commodity, although uh, much of it's handled by railroad, uh, our primary commodity is automotive parts, parts going to automotive assembly plants or aftermarket uh, warehouses. The, the other things we carry are, are tend to be consumer goods. We carry appliances, we carry uh, human food, pet food, beverages, uh, paper for printing, uh, we carry construction materials, shingles for roofing, lumber for uh, building houses. And, and a whole variety of things that, that uh, are, are not generally considered to be uh, carried by intermodal carriers. It also allows them to do this at a low cost without flat cars, and without cranes and terminals, and it allows the railroads to offer a product which is very similar to a trucking company's product. The road railer system is a patented technology produced by a company called Wabash National, which is headquartered in Lafayette, Indiana. It's the largest U.S. manufacturer of truck trailers. The concept of marrying the trucking and train businesses really isn't that new. Piggybacking on train flat cars has been around since the 1950s, so have versions of the road railer. In the 1980s, road railer trailers had the rail wheels permanently attached. But the road railers of today no longer carry their train wheels with them. The train wheels off, highway rubber on technology has made them much more lightweight, energy efficient, and competitive. Well, the road railer trailer uh, looks like an ordinary over-the-road trailer, but the resemblance is, uh, is a skin-deep resemblance because the road railer trailer has got to do some things that an ordinary over-the-road trailer would not be structurally capable of handling. And uh, the, way, the best way to think about it is that if I've got a 125-unit road railer train traveling up a mountain, that's probably as much as 4,800 trailing tons, or tons of road railer and lading, uh, going up a 2% grade in the Rockies. I have 124 trailers hanging on the back of that front trailer. That front trailer has got to be extremely uh, strong. And an ordinary trailer, if we tried to do that, would be ripped in half. So what we're doing with the road railer trailer, much like an airplane, we're making every piece of that trailer work for us in a variety of ways as a system to give us the strength that we require. The trailer assembly starts off with our front and rear underframe. We, uh, we build the sides up. Uh, the sides are composed of a, in most cases, a composite material called Duraplate, which is a, a, a material that Wabash uses to build our van trailers. It's a sandwich of steel skins and plastic core. Uh, we rivet the sides of the trailer together from panels that are 48 inches wide by uh, roughly 112 inches tall, which is the height of the box of the trailer. We then flip the sides up and fasten them to the, uh, the floor structure of the trailer, the floor structure consisting of uh, cross members. Uh, in effect, you might think of them as beams across, uh, across the bottom of the trailer. They're made of steel. And then we have the aluminum floor laid on top of that, and they're, and they're fastened together. Then we flip the sides up. We put on the the nose and the doors of the trailer, and then uh, lay a thin aluminum roof across the top uh, uh, over roof bows, which again are like the equivalent of rafters that actually hold the, uh, the roof of the trailer up. It's a great way to haul freight for several reasons. The first one is that the ride that the uh, unit gets, the freight gets in a road railer trailer is much better than it is in other forms of railroad technology. The ride gives the customer the same kind of ride and treatment he's used to when he rides over the highway. The road railer trailer doesn't couple by conventional means. It has a, uh, a link and pin coupler, essentially, which allows the train to move with absolutely no slack. Because of that, the, the principal cause of damage in, in railroad shipping, which is slack action between the cars, is eliminated here. Secondly, it provides security, which is much better than conventional railroad technology, because the trailers move so close to each other on a train 
that there's no way that a, a would-be vandal can open the door on the trailers. So it, it's very safe, very smooth, and very secure. The road railer system, a unique combination of truck and train, an efficient use of two separate types of transportation, 21st century freight shipping. In the world of model railroading, Lou Sassy is somewhat of a renaissance man. He does almost everything, and he does it all well. Lou is a photographer who's taken pictures of a variety of layouts for modeling magazines. He's an author of a number of how-to books for model railroad enthusiasts, and he is a longtime modeler himself. Well, it all started in the late 40s when my father gave my brother and I a Lionel train set for Christmas. And for about uh, eight or nine years, I played with a Lionel set and uh, added to it over the years until around 1958, I believe it was December of 58, I picked up an issue of Model Railroader magazine. And uh, in that issue, I saw some scale model HO trains that really impressed me, the photographs and the uh, re realism of the uh, models. So I changed over to HO after that, and I've been in that scale ever since. I started shooting photographs back in the late 70s. Uh, the first photographs I took of a model railroad were actually on a diorama that I had here at the house, and uh, I won the Dremel kit bashing award for it. Uh, shortly after that, uh, in the early 80s, I started doing photo shoots for model railroader, and uh, just uh, kind of steamrolled after I first started with a photo shoot or two uh, to the point where I was freelancing for them on a very re on a regular basis uh, shooting many model railroads uh, all over the country. Well I started doing books back in the early 90s and I, I've done two so far. One on uh, a, an HO layout that grows and another on scenery for model railroads and I'm presently working on another uh, edition which will be uh, super detailing scenery for model railroads. As you can clearly see, Lou's talent and expertise are evident. Developed over many years, Lou Sassy has been working on his own layout for more than a quarter of a century. It is, and always has been, a work in progress. And what a work it is. So realistic that it pulls you back into its 1950s time frame. His HO scale West Hoosick division runs between Massachusetts and Vermont. It's a bridge line owned and operated by the prototype Boston and Maine Railroad in northwestern Massachusetts and southeastern New York. It's extended to Bennington, Vermont, where it interchanges with another popular New England railroad, the Rutland. Lou's layout evolved as his expertise grew. It became more and more realistic. Gone were the days of freewheeling and freelancing, where his primary goal was to loosely capture the feel of New England railroading. Now, it's a replica of reality. It has symmetry. It flows. By focusing on a particular prototype, you have a family appearance to the locomotives. Uh, you can do research and find out what specific cars ran on the railroad. Uh, you can research the structures around the railroad, the uh, scenery around the railroad, uh, and you can base the model on reality. A few of the favorite features or locations on the layout are, uh, a couple of them in particular, are the, the large uh, trestle at Saul Hill. And I think that's a favorite because it took me so long to build the thing. And there's so, there was so much involved in the construction of it. Uh, there's 3,000 nut bolt washer castings on the the trestle. Well, it, the Hoosick Tunnel West Portal area is, uh, is one of my favorite spots because it was a, uh, a model of, it was given to me by a group of modelers in Massachusetts who actually made a model of the West Portal of the real Hoosick Tunnel. And the other version of that one is on display at the Heritage Park Museum in uh, North Adams, Massachusetts. Back in 1996, when there was a commercial video done on the layout, I finished all of the scenery. And uh, since that time, I've added a uh, closing loop, an unseen at closing loop, which allows me to run through trains. So the, in, in the future, actually, I'm just planning on adding a few more buildings, scratch-built structures to the layout, and just operating it on a regular basis.
Lou's books usually offer advice on simple techniques you can use to make realistic scenery for a layout of any size or scale. Step-by-step -step instructions for building a complete layout. It's pretty obvious he knows what he's writing about. But some of his most valuable advice is basic. Be willing to accept help from friends. And always remember, enjoy what you're doing. I know a lot of modelers who take a great deal of pride in, uh, in knowing that the, the railroad or the model railroad is all of their work, that they've done everything. But uh, myself, I get a great deal of pride in knowing that I've had a lot of talented people, friends that I've made over the years uh, through my photography work with Comback and people I've met in the hobby, and that my making my layout kind of a showcase for not only my work but their work brings me a great deal of satisfaction and pride. For people getting into the hobby, I would say that uh, my feelings are that you should probably bear in mind that it is a hobby, and as such, it's something that you should enjoy. Uh, no matter what you do, enjoy it. Have a good time. Uh, you know, use it as a source of relaxation. Uh, don't take yourself or it too seriously, and uh, I think you'll have a lot of fun at it. Lou Sassy is testament to both the possibilities and the pleasures that come with knowing how to do something well. And he's proof that the route to excellence can be full of enjoyable experiences. What we're going to demonstrate now is how to use plaster to make water. Most of you are familiar with using resin uh, to make a clear type of water, uh, such as in a pond, very smooth, very slick looking. Uh, Woodland Scenics and some others make a type of liquid that you can just pour in and it works beautifully, particularly for ponds or something with still water. But if you're going to model rapids or something where water flows, I found it a lot easier to use actual plaster. Now you may be wondering about the opacity of plaster, plaster but when you look at uh, actual water in, let's say, the Wabash River, the Ohio River, any of the rivers like the New River in West Virginia, you're going to find that they're absolutely opaque. If you stick your finger down into it, it's not going to be eaten away, but it is definitely going to just disappear. You don't see down into the water at all. And you also get water flowing over rock strata. And we're going to talk about rock strata in just a second, but that's the whole goal here. Now, I'm going to make a quick sketch here to just show you what I mean by strata. When, when uh, land was deposited, it was laid down in a series of beds. Uh, might be some very fine particles that uh, were mud, they turn into shale. Might be heavier particles, turn into sandstone. Uh, might be seashells, turn into limestone. And they form these beds. And it could be that at some point in time, the beds were tilted and eroded and they would just kind of stair step and create a, a stream bed that had ripples in it or even actual cataracts, some sort of a, a small waterfall. We're not going to model Niagara Falls here, but we're going to do it uh, with very low rapids to get that kind of a feeling of the sedimentary rock. Now, to do that, we need to build the stream up. I have a plywood, three-quarter inch plywood base here and I've glued two inch styrofoam to it. If you use styrofoam as I've done, use the blue stuff or the pink stuff, not the white stuff. The white stuff is a very crumbly material and it's just not satisfactory for scenery work at all. You'll often find it in a craft store, don't be tempted. Lumber yards will carry or Home Depot centers uh, will carry this kind of thing. Um, I glued it down just using a regular uh, liquid nails type adhesive. Uh, you can see the flat surface. You may want to continue it on up, but we needed to be able to look down in here, so I haven't continued the, the land contours. It's curving around out of sight. I'm assuming that you might view it from where I'm sitting, and it would be at eye level or something pretty high, and the river would just kind of disappear around the corner. So if this were a narrow shelf layout, it's two foot by two foot, uh, it would work just fine. Now, how do we build up these strata? We want to start with the base level and then go up a couple of times. And I'll just use scrap plywood, no sense uh, burning any important wood. And I'll draw a couple of lines across here just to suggest that we'll have the jump up in the strata here. Now, I'm going to do them three quarter inch at a time because that's the thickness of the plywood, but you could alternate it. You could have three quarter and then put another deck of quarter or just build it up to any level that you want. I'm just going to mark this and make a couple of quick cuts with a saber saw 
and make it fit within the river banks that I've just arbitrarily achieved here and I'm doing this by eye and if it doesn't quite fit we'll cut it again. You might notice that these two lines are parallel. If I were going around the corner I wouldn't do it radial like you would have ties on a railroad track going around a curve because the rock strata would all be coming up at the same uh, angle so uh, don't, don't be tempted to swing this around that way just keep everything parallel because that's the way it would actually work. Now anytime you fire up a saber saw or any other kind of noisy uh, instrument put on some headgear uh, so that you can not ruin your hearing and uh, if you don't wear uh, glasses that are non-breakable be sure to put on safety glasses as well. See how this fits? That'll work. You see some gaps along both sides here. Won't matter. We'll fill those in with plaster. Now we need to cut a second level that sits up here and we need to fill in the holes back in there so we'll just use some scrap uh, wood that uh, I happen to have and there that'll fit in. All it's got to do is hide or uh, elevate the uh, second layer. So let's use our another scrap piece of plywood and it happens to have a curve that looks like it's going to fit but remember I said you want these lines parallel so we're going to cut this at that same angle and we'll just kind of wish it around the corner here and hope it fits and if it doesn't we'll trim it. Well, let's see how well we've done. That'll work. Okay, now it's time to get out liquid nails and uh, we'll just glue these pieces down so that we've got a base for the scenery. One down. Two down. Okay, now, we were talking about sedimentary rocks. You can get rock castings like this in a hobby shop. Uh, this is a sedimentary rock casting. So we can take this, and I've got another piece here I've already marked, and I just made three quarter inch lines on the back of it. So all I have to do is saw these into uh, strips, and we have three quarter inch plywood, which is the reason for the three quarter inch lines and we'll glue them right to the front of this and then we'll fill in around that with plaster. Now I'm not going to use a jigsaw for this because my fingers are going to be a little too close to the uh, actual cut line and that would be dangerous plus this is also very soft material. Some of this material you can buy in a hobby shop actually you can bend so if you wanted to line the, the edges of the stream with sedimentary rock you'd want to buy the type that's more flexible and just put it right around the edges as well. Here we're assuming that we're going to come back and probably cover the banks with trees and that, which is not what we're talking about, but it's what you would do uh, on a stream bed like this. You can see here that we've got some nice texture. Um, it's kind of sharp edged where we've cut it off but after we glue it down we'll use a package knife and carve this to make it a little more rounded like the water was flowing across. Uh, got a nice angle here so that'll fit in just about there and my eyeball tells me that if I cut it right about there, this is not rocket science so you don't have to measure three times and cut once, that ought to just about fit in on either one of these. Um, that'll work. Neatness does not count when you're making scenery. Okay, let's do this whole process one more time and get a, a piece of rock for the upper level there. I'm going to take a scrap piece of rock and wipe off the extra 
uh, liquid nails because I don't want that sticking up in harm's way. But we'll just let this set for a while and uh, uh, as far as the glue goes. But while we're doing that, I'm going to mix up some plaster and we're going to fill, pretty thick plaster, and we're going to fill in all these gaps so that when we pour in the very thin plaster to make the water, uh, it won't all be running out on us. So I'm going to use a uh, margarine uh, tub and some uh, plaster. You can get into huge arguments as to whether you uh, pour the plaster first or the water first. Um, if you want to plaster walls for a living, maybe you want to worry about things like that. If you are making model railroad scenery, let somebody else worry about it. And again, I'm not going to use a lot of water because what I want here is something that's that's quite thick and um, not runny at all. Later we're going to go quite the opposite. We're going to look for something that's very runny. So you're going to use a lot more plaster than you probably imagine. And uh, we'll probably have to make a couple of batches of it. Now what I'm doing here is a uh, very thick mix. And to me, this is just a little too thick. So I'm going to add a little bit of water. There's no magic formula uh, to any of this stuff. And if you're worried about getting uh, plaster all over you and everything else, you're probably ought to find another hobby because it's a little bit messy. Okay, the first batch we'll just pour in the holes and uh, we're going to need a couple of more batches here. We've got almost all of the gaps sealed here. And what I'm going to do now is assume that, that you don't really want to see the texture of the foam. So it doesn't hurt to just pour some plaster on the foam. And just imagine that this is a much higher river canyon here on both sides. And you just continue this on up. But this gives you uh, more of the texture that you're going to be looking for in the final uh, scenery as opposed to seeing the actual uh, uh, cuts from the saw that were, were made into the foam. The riverbed doesn't matter at this point, although we don't want big lumps in it, but we're going to pour plaster down over this and like I said, we'll carve these rocks just a little bit, but this will seal everything. We now know that, that nothing's going to run out and get in our way. The next thing that we need to do now that the plaster is beginning to set up, it's still wet, but it doesn't matter because we're going to pour a very thin layer over it. But before we do that, we need to carve some smooth contours into these foam rocks that we glued to the front of the plywood. So let me just carve in here between these rocks to try to get something that looks a little more like uh, something you'd expect to see worn over, uh, you know, thousands if not millions of years. Okay, so we got some notches here. We can let water flow down there. We're going to fill in all of this area underneath as the water flows. So I'm going to just tip this up to get all the foam out of there. Oh, don't do this in the living room. And I have plaster in here. Let's add some water. I'm Probably have a lot more plaster than I'm going to need, but I want to make sure that it's it's uh, relatively thick. Okay, we don't want it to get too awfully thick because it's going down over a layer of, a layer of plaster, and when you, you you just won't believe how fast the underlying layer will suck up uh, the overlying layers of water now. If this doesn't scare you, nothing will. Okay, now we're going to have to work with this for a while. This isn't going to be one of these 30 seconds and you're done. Uh, that doesn't do it. But what I'm looking for is in these low points that I created, I'm looking for water to spill out. So in other words, on the, on the more prominent parts of the rocks that stick out. I don't want any water below them. But now as it starts to get some tack to this, down in these, these swales, these 
areas in between the rocks, I, I want to start moving plaster in there. And it, you know, it's going to flow in all directions. So we just got to let this sit a while. Keep playing with it. And suddenly, wham, it's going to start setting up. And you got to be ready for that. Well, that's setting up. This is a good time to try to get this surface up here ready for its final coat. And there's nothing like good old fingers to do that. Okay, now things are beginning to set well, so we can start shaping the water flow. And we're kind of pulling the water back upstream. We're just making sure that everywhere there's a, like I said, a, an indent, water is flowing out of there and flowing downstream. Don't want any lumps down here. And we're just about at the point where I think we can pull this off. Well, we're finally to the last pour of plaster. We've got the base in where we filled all the cracks. We put a kind of a base coat over everything. We created the flow of the water over the rock outcroppings. And now all we're going to do is fill in some of the rough spots to make it look pretty smooth. Again, we're not looking for that glossy uh, cattail pond sort of look. We're looking for something here that's got some dynamic to it, some flow. So I'm going to get a pretty soupy mix here. And uh, it'll take a while to dry, but that's okay. I'm more interested in uh, having it flow evenly than I am at this point to fill any, any holes or anything. One other thing in favor of a pretty soupy mix, and this is just like water almost, uh, and it may be too thin, but I'm not worried about it because this stuff will soak up water. I talked about that earlier, and it, anytime you put plaster over plaster, look out because it's going to thicken up. Now you can see there's some rough area in here, so we'll just pour it in here. And you can see here it is just liquid. And again, I'm not looking for that perfect ping pong table uh, glassy surface. I'm just looking for something that uh, doesn't look like it's got oatmeal lumps in it. So I'll start fairing that in there, and then once this all sets up a little bit more, I'll smooth it out. Uh, I can wet my fingers and rub over the top of it and get a pretty smooth surface for the first sealer coat of paint, which will be a, a basic CTC pea soup green. Now this is going to dry, uh, and when it does uh, start setting up, we'll pull this up into here to make sure we don't go down and then out. Uh, I see a couple low areas here, spread plaster around in there, and again, the Mark I finger uh, will take care of that. Now I see a little low areas back here from viewing it out here, this is as though a, it's going out of sight, there'll be trees here, I would assume, if you want to hit on a, on a layout, but I would just as soon get a little bit of this filled in so that, that we don't have any holes that we've got to worry about. And uh, since we made this pretty thin, it'll be pretty much self-leveling. What we're going to do now is seal all of this that we've uh, poured with the light plaster, the very soupy thin mix. We've made it flow over the rocks. And you almost can't see the rock casting anymore, but we'll pick that out with uh, some yellow to make it look like sandstone after we get all the coloration done. But right now, all we want to do is seal this with some sort of a color. Uh, we're going to use a color uh, that is very much uh, a good color for almost any use on a model railroad. This is a kind of a uh, uh, olive drab color like you might see on an army jeep. But for demo purposes, we'll just paint inside the river. We won't worry at all about whether we're going to uh, um, keep it that color later on. For example, the tan rocks or anything not worry in the slightest about any of that. All we want to do is get a coat of paint on here uh, that uh, seals everything. What we're doing now is we've got the uh, paint sealed on here. This is that CTC machine green that I was talking about earlier. Just a sealant. Could have used black or any other color. What I want to do now is to get that pea soup green color that's so typical of uh, water with a lot of sediment in it washing out of the hills. And the way we'll get that is with uh, a mixture of green, good guess, 
uh, browns to kind of grunge it up and yellows to bring that color up a little bit. I'm not a professional artist. These are just ways I get there from here. Uh, and we'll just put that on as a base coat. We'll start looking for areas where we might add a little brown to it to suggest the shore. But we're not trying to show water where you're looking down into it, which is what you do with resin. Here, the surface is what you get. That's it. So we'll just start glooping this stuff on and see how it works. And uh, any luck at all, we'll come up with something. You can see that doesn't look very much like water uh, of any color unless it's got a lot of algae in it. But once we get some yellow in there, my take is that we're going to start getting a lot closer to what we want pretty darn fast. That's starting to get me a little closer to where I want to go. We can try that as a first coat and see what happens. Well, I can see right now that that's too green by quite a bit, but it'll still make a good first coat. Okay, now that we've got the green on there, I think it's probably already starting to set up. Acrylic set up pretty fast. So what we'll do now is we'll mix some uh, yellow, some white and some brown together to try to get a sandstone color. Uh, I put the three of them together right here and mixed them up and you can see this kind of a, I don't know what you'd call it, taupe or putty or whatever color. Um, all I want really is just a sense of, uh, of color on the end. Now, any of these flow areas here, we don't want any color in those because that's where the stream is flowing down. It's just in some of these spots, we just want to pull out a little color. What we're going to do eventually is to coat the water with a gloss medium. Uh, it's like matte medium you've heard to glue things together, like scenery. But before we do that, what we need to do is add some white streaks to the water. And we're going to do that with a technique called dry brushing plus some titanium white acrylic paint. I'm not going to need uh, too much of this because a little bit goes a long way. And I don't want to just dip the brush in here and then start painting because if I do that, I'm going to have a lot more paint than I want. So I'll just try to rub some of this off. Now I've got a little paint on here and I'm just going to start, see how it's, it, it really doesn't even want to come off the brush. But if I just start dipping it in here and dabbing it on, what you're going to see slowly but surely, and I don't want to get greedy and get too much of this, is you're going to start seeing a sense of flowing water here. And notice I'm pulling it downstream that away, uh, just like it would flow in real life. And already you're starting to see the roughness of the plaster is, is now an asset because it's not letting us get smooth streaks. It's uh, forcing some foam and it uh, looks like ripples in water because there'd be a lot of turbulence downstream. So already we're, we're doing well. Now you can see there's quite a bit of white there. That's probably a little more uh, than I wanted. So I'm going to just drag a little white up in here. Not much. I don't want to overdo it. And if I get a spot that's a little streaky, it doesn't bother me a bit. There's obviously a, just below the surface there, a rock. You knew that, right? And that's what we're showing here. So, okay. Now, hopefully you're beginning to think, well, maybe this is going to come out okay after all. And we're going to let this dry for a few minutes. It doesn't take too long. Uh, then we're going to come back with a gloss medium, and if we pick up a little of the base color with a gloss medium, because uh, it's the same kind of stuff, latex, we don't really care as long as we don't turn the water yellow or something, but even that you could probably find a prototype for. So let's let this dry and we'll come back to it in a few minutes. Now that we're going to put a coat of gloss medium on top of that, the softer brushes would work just fine, but I would like to make sure that I've got it spread out nice and evenly, so I'm going to use an even whiter brush, which is a typical brush you pick up for painting window sashes with a bevel cut. doesn't matter, but it's a nice smooth brush. And we're using, uh, it happens to be Liquitex brand, Gloss Medium, but there's a lot of other brands that you'll find in a hobby shop. It's Gloss Medium. Don't worry about it. Pick it up and use it. You could even put uh, a coating of some of the other uh, products that are sold to make water out of and just use it as a final coat. So experiment. If you can't find one, try another. Let's just pour some of this in here. Uh, right now it's going to look uh, very milky and until it starts setting up later on, uh, it's not going to have any sense of the uh, uh, 
transparency that we're looking for. But you can see here as we're working it already, it's uh, uh, pretty much thinned out, so we don't have to worry about that milkiness, and it dries completely clear. I, I suspect most of you have used a, a matte medium to uh, glue your scenery down, like the foam and that kind of thing. And the same stuff, and you know how it's got kind of that milky color, white glue, same way you put it down, you think, uh-oh, and it all dries and goes away. Makes it very clear. Now, notice I'm making no effort here to not paint the rocks. Um, I don't care that they're a little shiny because I can't imagine anything that's around this much water is uh, not going to wind up being at least moist and damp. So everything having a sheen to it uh, would be fine. That pretty much is it. Uh, I think you can see my point about how we needed plaster to fill in where the water is flowing. So without a whole lot of effort, I think we've come up with an alternative way of doing some things that uh, resins don't do well. On the other hand, there's a whole bunch of things that resins and that type of material do much better than this. So it's not like one size fits all. You've got to kind of pick your weapons when you're in a specific battle and solve problems a specific way and I hope this has helped you solve uh, the problem when you want to have some very rapid flowing water over some sedimentary uh, ledges. Norbert and Gerald Winsky of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, have constructed a garden railroad using brightly colored trains to complement beautiful flowers. It's the enjoyment of working outside with my dad and running the larger scale trains outside rather than the smaller scale trains down on the basement layout and working together, uh, building the bridges and the buildings, uh, having the neighbors come over and enjoy the train with us. There seem to be a lot of scenes in your railroad layout. Can you take us on a tour? Sure. Uh, the train passes through a town with several buildings, western style buildings. Uh, plenty of flowers to pass by. There's a train station with a water tank. Several bridges that the train crosses as it travels around the layout. There's uh, several scenes. Uh, there's a track gang working on, on the track near the coal tipple. The train passes under a a trestle as it goes around the pond past the waterfall. Uh, there's another station the train passes by as it makes its climb up the grade and around through a scene with cactus and then it passes through a tunnel and uh, it continues its run along our, our fence line and returns to the same town. It, it started out uh, in the spring uh, three years ago and uh, there was nothing back here really it was just all grass and we had planned out the layout over the winter time and uh, we went out and bought the landscape timbers and set those up. Uh, hauled in 22 yards, hand shoveled 22 yards of topsoil to fill everything in. And then we proceeded to lay track. And over a three month period, the railroad came together and uh, we added uh, uh, the flowers as the season progressed and uh, rearranged the rocks so that they'd fit the scene uh, more properly. Started ballasting the track uh, to give it that real railroad appearance. Well, there are several problems that uh, are unique to running trains outside. Uh, you have uh, all your weather elements, your rain, sun, snow. Uh, we get washouts just like the real railroads, and we have to repair that. Uh, being a northern climate here in uh, Wisconsin, uh, we get uh, lots of frost heave. And the, the track needs to be realigned come springtime, just, just like uh, any railroad has to realign their track for good running. And we have to clean the track. There's bugs you run over while you're running your train, and, and uh, the birds, uh, they walk the tracks. And I, I, I use a, a chicken grit for my ballast, so they enjoy eating that. So we have to always reballast things. And come winter time, too, you have the snow. And there's the enjoyment. Uh, if you don't have too much snow, you can come out here and sweep the the large amounts out of the way and you can run the trains during the winter time in the snow. It, it's fun around Christmas time to do that. Gerald, do you and your father have any plans to further expand this already beautiful layout? Well, we've gone to the limits of the backyard now. Uh, I'd like to scratch build some, some turnouts so we could have some passing sightings and uh, possibly a turntable and a roundhouse for the engines. Garden railroading seems to be a very rewarding way to approach the hobby, especially if you have a green thumb.
Today I'm going to show you tips and techniques that will make ballasting an enjoyable process. And soon you'll be looking forward to ballasting instead of dreading the task. When ballasting track, you want to take it in small steps. I like to start between the rails. And the reason I use that technique is because you can cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. And what I like to do is load up a little drinking cup here with ballast. This particular brand of ballast is from Highball Products. It's a light gray and dark gray blend. What I've done is I've just filled up a little bit of the cup with the ballast, and then I pulled it into a trough, and I'm just going to pour it in between the, the ties here. And one thing with ballasting is that neatness counts early. The less of a mess you make early on, the less of a mess you have to clean up later. All right. Now I'm going to use this half inch paintbrush to spread the granules between the ties and distribute them evenly. The uh, half inch paintbrush doesn't need to be an expensive one. This is just a real basic paintbrush. Here you don't need to spend much more than three, four dollars because you're going to be using it for ballasting and not for painting, so don't worry about getting anything fancy. The reason the half inch brush works well is that it fits right between the rails on HO scale track. Then what I do is I just take the brush and we're just going to spread the ballast. Then we're going to come back and keep working it back and forth. And much like the prototype, you want to keep the granules off the tie tops. Prototype railroads are concerned about keeping ballast off of the ties because when the trains are going by, the ballast can be pulled up and it can disconnect air hoses or can cause other uh, mechanical problems on trains. I'm just going to make a quick look here to make sure I don't have any ballast granules in the web of the rail here. I want to keep it out of there as well because we don't want the flanges of our model railroad equipment to catch on that, potentially causing a derailment. The next step in ballasting is to cover the shoulders or the edge between the outside of the ties and the base of the roadbed. And to do that, it's going to take a two-step process. The first step is to apply a slightly diluted layer of white glue along the shoulder and then to sprinkle on just a dusting of ballast. And what this does is it provides a base for the second layer of ballast. Resist the temptation to put on all the ballast on the shoulders at one time because what will happen is when you try to glue it in place, the top layer will, have, will dry hard but the ballast underneath will be loose and when you come through to clean your track, the first time you pass over it with your shop vac, it's going to wind up in the bottom of the vacuum. We'll go ahead and mix the glue. I'm just going to put this full strength Elmer's glue in the bottom of a little paint mixing dish. And again, your goal is to mix it about 10 or 15 percent with water. You don't want it too runny because you want to you want to keep the glue contained to the area you want the ballast to go on. So that's about enough there. And we'll Go ahead and dump in just a bit of water. I'm just going to go ahead and mix it up. Uh, scenery can be kind of messy, so don't worry about getting your fingers a little dirty in the process. Okay, this is a little runnier than I want it to, so I'm going to add in a bit more white glue. All right. That's about the consistency I'm looking for. Next, we'll go ahead and apply the glue to the shoulders. I just use another half inch paintbrush. This is not the same one that I use for spreading the ballast. You want to have a separate one for gluing because the bristles are going to start to get a little bit dry and hard from the glue. So you want to have a separate brush for this pro process. We're just going to go ahead like this. Just work it along. Um, just kind of use the end of the ties as your guide. And then 
The glue should be about the consistency of latex paint, though mine looks to be a little bit thin, but this should still work. And I'm going to go ahead and bring back the ballast cup again, and we're just going to apply a real thin layer. You don't need a whole lot at this point, because remember, we're going to come back with a second layer once this glue is dried. Now with the first layer of ballast applied, I'm going to go ahead and use a shop vac to clean up the loose granules. With the glue drying the first layer of ballast along the shoulders, I'm going to go ahead and apply the second and final coat of ballast. Again with the ballasting, try to carefully get it in between the tie-ins first, and then we'll worry about getting it along the uh, outside of the roadbed here. Now you'll notice that I'm piling it on a little more along the uh, base of the road bed, and that's okay because I'm going to come back with a foam brush and shape it to the right contour. Using a half inch dry brush, I'm going to go ahead and groom the ballast. And again, I want to keep the uh, ballast granules off the tie tops. That looks pretty good. Now I'm going to go ahead and use this foam brush to help shape the ballast along the, the sides of the roadbed. And the reason I like using the foam brush is because it has a bevel edge similar to that of the roadbed itself. And then what I'm going to do once I have it lined up is I'm going to kind of pull the foam brush over like this to get that that uh, profile I'm looking for. Now you'll notice that there are a few high spots in the ballast here where I put it on a little heavier than I should have. I'm just going to take the foam brush and I'm going to press the granules down and then we'll just kind of lightly tap the foam brush Now after I've applied the ballast, I notice that I have a bit of a light spot right in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to dump a little bit more ballast in there. And I also notice that the ballast is a little light between the ties, so I'm going to go ahead and fill that in a bit more. All right, now I'll come back with my brush. Yeah, patience is really important when ballasting. You don't want to rush this process, otherwise you're going to wind up doing it over again. And don't ask me how I know this. And actually, a, a, a good way to practice ballasting is in an environment like this, such as a small diorama. This is a good time where you can experiment Try different uh, techniques for applying the ballast. There are different tools available commercially for distributing ballast. So, though I'm using uh, uh, paint brushes and foam brushes, you can certainly use commercial tools as well. Now I'm going to go ahead and add the cinders. Um, this is also from Highball Products. And I just pour it into the spoon, then we'll just carefully apply it along the edge here. Now don't worry if some of them dribble down into your scenery because that's going to look prototypical like some of them have just, you know, some of them have been dumped and the air and pieces have rolled down the hillside here. Uh, 
All right. Now we'll go ahead and use the foam brush to help smooth out the cinders. All right, now with the dry ballast in place, it's time to go ahead and get ready to glue it down. Before you apply the glue, the first step is to wet the ballast. I like to use 70% isopropyl alcohol. Some modelers will dilute this a bit with water, but take in mind that this is already 30% water, so you really don't want to dilute it much more. Then using the spray bottle, we'll just go ahead, make sure the spray pattern's okay, and then we'll just mist on the alcohol like this. Now the purpose of wetting the ballast is that it's going to help the matte medium or the diluted white glue wick into the granules better and that's the key because if the glue doesn't get all the way to the bottom of the granules it's not going to stick and it's going to come up. Now that the isopropyl alcohol has had a few minutes to soak into the ballast we'll go ahead and start adding the glue. I'm going to use Woodland Scenics Scenic Cement for this project, which is a diluted matte medium. Some modelers prefer to use diluted white glue with a few drops of dish soap added, and that'll work fine as well. I've already shaken the bottle. It's important with the commercial matte mediums that you get all the glue off the bottom so it'll hold the granules in place, or your scenery for that matter. Then, using a pipette, I'm just going to draw some of the matte medium Load it up about like that, and we'll just start applying the glue. Now a technique that I like to use is putting the pipette tip right against the rail. And what that does is it helps, helps me just keep the pipette steady. And I'm applying just a slight amount of pressure. You don't want to squeeze the glue out and have it blast in the granules, otherwise it's going to flush them right out and your ballast is going to have to be redone. I'm just going to go ahead and work from the other side. And the goal is to just to have it so the matte medium, you can see just a bit of white poking out between the granules. Now I'll go ahead and we'll start adding the matte medium to the cinders. And you'll notice that I'm just dribbling it on ever so lightly. You don't want the pressure, you don't want to squeeze it too forcefully because in, in this portion of the ballast, It'll wash the ballast right off the edge and into your scenery. And then I'm going to go along where the cinders meet the ballast. And what that's going to do is it's going to draw the matte medium up along the sides here as well. And we'll work along the ends of the ties here. And here it's a little clearer to see how the matte medium, you're just seeing that, that little bit of white, which is what you want to see. That's the sign that it's soaking in completely and that it's going to hold the ballast in place. Now once you've applied the matte medium, you want to let it set for about 24 hours just to make sure that your granules are going to stay in place. Now that the glue's had sufficient time to dry, I'm going to go ahead and clean any of the stray granules off the tie tops. To do that, I'm going to use a 5-in-1 tool. And I'm just going to carefully scrape off these stray granules. You see we got a few in here. Now I've already, before I ballasted the track, I painted the rails and ties with polyscale railroad tie brown. And you'll notice it when I scrape off these granules that some of the paint is also coming off the ties. Don't worry about that because in a few minutes we're going to come in and we're going to weather between the rails and along the shoulders of the rails and most of this stuff's going to be covered up. And when I'm cleaning the uh, granules off the tie tops, I'm also checking the web of the rail or this little spot right in here to make sure there are no granules.
Now that the granules are off the tie tops, we'll go ahead and weather the tracks with an airbrush. I've mixed some polyscale steam power black, one part paint to nine parts 70% isopropyl alcohol. And I'm going to use the black between the rails. And the, the purpose of that is to simulate the oil and grease drippings that would come off the locomotives and the various freight cars that pass over the line. So we'll just go ahead and just put on a real thin coat. And as you can see, the black paint is also covering up some of the paint that came off the ties. And about like that is, is fine. If you want to make your track a little dirtier looking, it's really a matter of personal preference. Now I'm going to go ahead and weather the area between the scenery and the cinders. I've mixed up some polyscale dirt mixed to the same ratio as the black paint that I used earlier. Now when doing any airbrushing, you want to make sure you're working in a well-ventilated area and taking proper safety precautions. Now the purpose of this coat is to help provide a transition line between the granules and the existing scenery. And don't worry if any granules blow out along the way, we can just clean those up later. I'm going to apply a light mist of the dirt paint over the uh, gray ballast granules as well. Since this is going to be used as a photographic diorama, I want to just slightly tone down that gray so it doesn't wash out in photographs. Once the ballast is weathered, we'll go ahead and clean up the railheads with a bright boy, and then we can go ahead and start displaying our trains on this diorama. As you can see, Ballasting is a very rewarding task, and it adds a great deal of realism to our layouts. And with just a little bit of time and some patience and the right tools, you can make your track look just like the real thing. People come to St. Louis to ride to the top of the arch and enjoy the fine views. They head into town to catch a Cardinals game at Bush Stadium. But no trip to this town with the familiar skyline is complete without a moment to reflect on the history and the present of railroads. The Terminal Railroad Association of St. Louis was once the largest terminal operation in the world. St. Louis Union Station boasted 42 tracks and more than 8,000 employees. It was considered a masterpiece of train station design the TRRA itself was formed from six terminal companies. The Terminal Railroad Association was formed in July of 1889 as a jointly owned company and its purpose in life was to provide uh, transportation service, yard service and, and service over the river. In its earliest stages, the terminal was owned by 16 of the different railroads that came to St. Louis from the east and from the west. Over uh, time, uh, operations have changed. Uh, we used to operate Union Station, where there used to be up to 100 train moves a day in and out of Union Station. And then in the late 50s and into the 60s, that the operation began to uh, diminish as it, has, as it did other places in the country. Grand Old Union Station, which once bustled with trains, was abandoned by Amtrak and sold off by the TRRA. But it is now, again, a vibrant center of activity in St. Louis. The place that was once home to classic trains from yesteryear is now home to restaurants and stores. Travelers stepping aboard to distant destinations are now only an echo in these majestic spaces, but the stunning building has managed to maintain the flavor of its proud railroad heritage. And today it stands as a really fine example of a redeveloped older facility that has uh, stands on its own and a major attraction in St. Louis. The Terminal Railroad Association is a living link to the vital history of rail in and around St. Louis. It maintains more than 200 miles of track which breaks down to 50 in Main Line, 150 in the Yard and Hump Yard, 
Roughly 2,600 cars roll through each day. Ownership is condensed, and today this is the heart of a streamlined operation that keeps the freight moving. Over time, as railroads, the Class 1 railroads have merged, we now come down to the point where we're owned by five Class 1 railroads, the Union Pacific, Norfolk Southern, the BN Santa Fe, CSX, and the Canadian National Slice Illinois Central. Our business has changed. We own two river bridges now. Uh, about 1,800,000 cars a year move over our property and trackage rights. Uh, trains are run by our connections with their crews and their power. We also do intermediate switching for about 350,000 cars in our Menace Yard, primarily for the BNSF, NS, and CSX. For this hard-working rail operation, the future looks bright. Customers rely on them day in and day out and show no signs of going elsewhere. The steady pounding of freight cars and locomotives are at once the sound of tradition and success as we move into a new century where rail is a key component of transportation. We do expect to be here for the long run. We've learned in the last several years that the industry needs switching yard capacity that uh, has become uh, most obvious in the, in the uh, aftermath of the UP-SP uh, merger a couple years ago and then the NS. CSX split of Conrail in 1999. While things have changed, the historic heart of rail is still beating strong here in St. Louis. It is a living testament to the fact that rail works, that trains are not extinct, and that steel rails are still critical arteries of our country. The Cuyahoga Valley and West Shore Model Railroad Club in Olmstead Falls, Ohio, incorporates two layouts in its building in Olmstead Falls in an old New York Central passenger station. Our first layout is an old tin plate layout. This is in a room 20 by 20 feet large and shows the beginnings of the model railroad hobby. In our other room, which is 20 feet by 30 feet, we show a contemporary style HO gauge layout with 600 feet of mainline trackage. We also have 200 feet of yard plus 85 switch machines, which make the whole railroad operational. Our club station, which we're currently in right now, was originally owned by the Lakeshore Michigan Southern Railroad. They moved out in 1954, and the New York Central took over the building and had it until the late 60s, when Penn Central took over. We rented the building from Conrail in 1977 and have been here over 12 years. Currently, we have been doing restoration work on the interior, Plus, we also received a new addition to our building, which is an ex-Pennsylvania Railroad N8 caboose. This was donated to us by the Consolidated Railroad Corporation. On the railroad that we have, we are looking at an area of southern Ohio and eastern Pennsylvania, the slightly rolling hills with not very high mountains. Our railroad has runs through a very large yard and some very, very scenic areas. Our most spectacular scene on the layout was created by a gentleman by the name of Dan Dorco and Mike Matthews. It's called the Dorco Mine Complex. And Dan Dorco, the man behind it, spent hours and hours of time putting this area together to make it look spectacular. The interesting structures, the, the gazebo and the sawmill, are built by a member by the name of Mark Schreiber. Mark is an expert at building and detailing structures. He detailed the, the gazebo to incorporate a little bit of everything, with the exception of the sound of the band playing. The band is there on the gazebo. To, uh, to be a club member in this club, um, we have full access to our building 24 hours of the day. We have our own facilities that we would need to, to be able to work in here. Plus, we have a busy main line that we can watch trains if we are just coming out to enjoy ourselves and relax and get away from the busy world. Our operation currently in the HO area uh, is a sort of a test operation, a test bed situation. We're not really sure what type of throttle systems we would like to use yet. 
So we have been experimenting with different types of throttles and cab control to run our railroad. Our club members like to bring in different types of rolling stock and motive power to run from the different railroads. We see different railroads operating on our layout from the Southern Railroad, the Chesapeake in Ohio, the Baltimore in Ohio, and my favorite, the Southern Railroad. It makes for an interesting piece of operation also when the freelance modelers come in and bring in railroads and short line pieces of equipment that have not been seen. The advice that I would give to any member or anyone that is interested in starting a club is to look at your members or look at the prospective members. If they have a talent and they show you a talent, develop it. Let them develop the talent. There are people out there with excellent talents. Let them develop that talent that is there. Don't let them hide it. If there is, if there's no talent, then that person is not needed in a club. But if you have people with talent, let them develop it and show it and be proud of it. And don't rip it out if they try. Because that, that causes a total rip of a club. And it really hurts. I'd much rather see groups that are starting to have fellowship and to work together as a team, not as a bunch of individuals who don't know where they're going. It makes a, a lot easier to be able to put a complete club together and have enjoyment and fellowship of operation. Weathering is a term we model railroaders use for the processes that we use to make our model trains look older as if they've been out in nature for a while. Two of the tools we use quite frequently are pastels, basically colored powdered chalk in stick form, and an airbrush. Both of these techniques are especially good for creating an overall even effect. The soot on the roof of a diesel locomotive or the dust on the side of a freight car to recreate the way it would look if it had been in service for many, many months. Some weathering doesn't occur evenly. Areas where there's a lot of contact, a step or maybe the side of a door, something like that, will have the paint scuffed off of it. Those areas often appear lighter. Areas that are below the main surface of the object will be darker. Dirt, oil will accumulate in there. There are a couple of techniques we can use to recreate these effects to increase the apparent depth. Our models really don't have a lot of depth to them compared to the real trains, but we can increase that with either a wash, which is a very thin dark light coat of paint that you apply so that it goes down into the crevices, or dry brushing, which is a light colored coat of paint that you apply to the high areas. The first technique we'll look at today is dry brushing. It's basically brush painting. You use the same tools and basically the same stroke, but you have almost no paint on your brush. It's a dry brush. That's where the name comes from. On this refrigerator car, I want to lighten the high areas on the brown roof. So I have some tan paint here, basically the same hue as the roof, but just a little bit lighter shade. Get a little bit of paint on it, brush virtually all of it off, and then I just brush lightly across the ribs. The idea is that the paint will stay on the ribs, but not on the panels. And that increases the illusion of depth. It's not a big deal if you get a little bit on the uh, on the running board here, again, those are areas where there would have been someone walking, so they would be scuffed. Okay, so now we have our brown roof on the refrigerator car, but the ribs, the running board, and the handles and hinges on the hatches are a little bit lighter. Here's the roof of the refrigerator car after dry brushing. Here's the same car before. You'll see that the difference isn't all that significant. It's a little bit subtle, but you do notice it. It looks more realistic. You can use almost any kind of paint that works for you for dry brushing. I like to use acrylics for two reasons. One is they're easy to use, they dry pretty quickly, and the other is if I make a mistake, I can fix it. On this car, I'm going to dry brush the trucks with this gray color here. 
Now let's say that I dry brush and boy, I look at it and now that I look at it, it, it just looks overdone, too much. All you have to do, take another brush, dip it in a little bit of Windex, and wipe the paint away. Take a larger brush, go over the truck, dry the side of the car, and we're all set to start again. You can also use dry brushing for special effects. On this covered hopper car, I already airbrushed along the ribs with a rust color. On the real car, there's a weld there, and that's the first place the car corrodes. But again, on the real car, the ribs themselves don't rust. And so right now what we have is the rust color next to the ribs, but also on the ribs. So what I want to do is bring the ribs back to body color. So I'll take the body color paint, dry my brush, and then dry brush the ribs. Now the ribs, which again are higher than the rest of the surface and wouldn't be rusted, stand out against the rust. The second technique we'll look at today is called washing. It's a very thin coat of paint, usually a dark color, that you brush on the side of a piece of rolling stock or a structure or even some scenery to increase the depth. For my washes, I usually use artists' oil paints and I thin them with turpenoid, which is a basically an odorless paint thinner meant for, uh, meant for artists. It's still an organic, so you still need to make sure you have good ventilation, but it, uh, well, is odorless. Put a little bit of turpenoid on your brush. Get a little bit of paint on your brush. And then you simply wash the side of the model. Now I'll go across the boards here to make sure I get in between them, but I'll also make sure to come back vertically so that there aren't streaks running in the wrong direction. Now that the washes have dried, you can really see the difference between the car that I didn't weather and the car that I did. You can also use oils and turpenoid to create some special effects, such as a rust spot that has dripped a little bit down the side of the car. I'll take this small micro brush, touch it to the side of the car in a few places to make it look like we have a little bit of rust. Then I'll take a second micro brush, dip it in just a little bit of thinner, and touch it to the rust spots, which will then just drip down the side a little bit. You'll get a very smooth edge with this technique because you really are recreating the action that would take place on the real car. Once the paint and turpenoid dry, this is what you have. It's easy to see the difference between the car before I weathered it and the car after. Dry brushing and washing are two really straightforward techniques that are very easy to use. Give them a try. I think you'll like the results. I received my first train set at Christmas time when I was about eight years old. It was a wind-up mark set. 
and I just loved it. And I, I got tired of winding the engine up after a while, so the next, next Christmas I begged for an electric train, and, and I received another, wine, another electric train mark set. And that was, that was about it until I was a freshman in high school. Then I uh, bought my first American Flyer set, which was a 322 Hudson, because I liked realism and the two-rail track. Uh, that about put me in the flyer. The size of Brad's layout is 24 feet by 14 feet. The construction is pretty much tabletop rather than open framework. Oh, he's had to cut out in several places for the gorges, but it provides a good base for the accessories and track. There are about 350 feet of track, which includes the main line and sidings. Track is all soldered together for smooth running. Brad used about 25 American flyer switches combined with Gargrave's track. On the layout, there is a mixture of steam and diesel locomotives. The freight cars are mostly New Line L cars, but there are some original flyer cars as well. Unlike most flyer collection, Brad wants his trains to run rather than sit on a shelf. The mountains and hills were added on the top using plaster. There are lots of trees on this layout and the forests look very realistic. Like most non-scale layouts, there is a lot of scenery jammed into a small area. So it was easy to mix a village with industry and include things that you normally wouldn't find side by side in real life. There are a lot of industrial scenes to show off those operating accessories. There is a milk loader, an oil dairy, water tower, and a lot of things that break up the monotony of just having a train run in a circle. For example, a log loader loads logs on a car, which can be delivered to a sawmill. Boards can then be delivered to a lumber yard in the city. The coal loaders work in the same way. Coal can be delivered to one and loaded into a car. The car can be delivered to another place for unloading and loading into a truck. There is also much activity on the layout. The drum loader can load the freight cars. Magnetic crane can load and unload scrap. The track gang can actually stop a train. Brad has a mixture of Lionel, Flyer, and Mark's accessories. He's not real particular about having Flyer only and uses whatever fits best on the layout. There are several scratch built structures on the layout. One of Brad's friends built some of them, like the station and coal terminal. Brad built the attention-getting bridges out of wood and plastic and thinks that everybody is always interested in seeing the trains go over a river or gorge or something else. There are some plastic structures, but the scratch built are easier to weather and look more realistic on the layout. Four trains can be run at once. Having several trains moving at the same time is more exciting and breaks up the monotony of just having a train go around and around. You can also be working a train in the yards while the mainline trains are also in operation. Brad likes American Flyer because it's realistic. It's 316 scale and if blown up, it would be the same as a real train. The two rail track, the smoke and choo-choo sound make it very realistic and also worm drive motors give lots of power to those long trains run on this railroad. My advice to modern is to get a good track plan. Have patience. Get your track work down good. Uh, get the curves nice and smooth. Solder the joints. Uh, get, get your plan for your accessories. If your train doesn't run right, it doesn't look right. O-Gage track uses three rails instead of two to power locomotives. It's a design that's been around for 100 years in fact, a piece of O-Gage track that Lionel made in 1915 would match up perfectly with this piece of track that was just made a few years ago. Here's a piece of O-Gage track from 1934, and as you can see, the old piece and the new piece still match up. Many O-Gage track plans call for odd-sized pieces of track, sections that you can't buy in a hobby shop. But with this hollow profile, this is very cuttable, and you can cut in the middle or at the ends, and in profile, the other sections will match up perfectly. There are three ways to cut O-Gage track. One, with tin snips, two, with a hacksaw, and three, with a rotary tool. I've already clamped the piece of track we're gonna cut 
and a bench vise. As you can see, it's between two pieces of wood. This piece of wood is vertical, so it fits between the ties and holds the bottom of the rail steady, and the other piece of wood holds the top of the rail steady. Using tin snips takes a little bit of muscle to cut through the top of the rail, and as you get down to the bottom flange, what you'll want to do is swing back and forth to break that so you don't misalign the front flange. What you're left with is a sharp edge from the tin snips. Make sure you want to file both the corners and the top edge of the rail. The tin snips have crushed the hole where the pin will go, so to open it up again, I'm going to use a screwdriver a nail set, and a pair of wire bending pliers to reshape the rail head. This may take a little fiddling, but once you're through, take your time and you'll have a railhead profile that'll look just like the piece of section that wasn't cut. A hacksaw makes a cleaner cut than the tin snips, but you have to be careful because the back and forth action of the hacksaw can easily dislodge the rail from the ties that hold it together. You'll want to be sure to wear safety glasses. It doesn't hurt. Make your strokes slowly because the thin metal that makes up the rail bends easily. Be sure to get a straight stroke so you don't have a crooked rail cut. As with the tin snips, you want to file carefully and get the sharp corners off of the flange corners and the rail head. One of the flange ends is bent, so using a pair of pliers, I'll put it back into place. I've noticed when I cut with the tin snips, I also messed up one of the flanges. But again, the track, the metal that uh, makes up the track is soft enough that you can bend it back into shape. And the nature of O-gauge trains is such that they're very forgiving over rougher joints. Third way to cut Lionel track is with a rotary tool with a reinforced cutting wheel You'll definitely want to wear safety glasses for this and set your tool to a higher speed. A rotary tool makes the cleanest cut of all, but you'll still need to file any rough edges. Just be careful and wear your safety glasses. Using any of these three cutting methods, you'll be able to piece O-gauge sections to fit any track plan you desire. Some of the prettiest scenery in the eastern United States can be found in New Hampshire. And one of the easiest ways to see it is on board one of the trains of the Conway Scenic Railroad.
The Conway Scenic Railroad is located in the heart of North Conway Village, New Hampshire. It's a village surrounded by the 780,000 acre White Mountain National Forest. It's just an hour and a half from Portsmouth, two and a half hours by car from Boston. These great trains offer three wonderful trips. The trains leave from the historic North Conway Station. The station was built more than 125 years ago when steamboats and stagecoach were the preferred methods of transportation to reach the North Conway. It's a Victorian style station built in 1874 in what was then a prestigious summer resort. Well, the station um, is a beautiful station that was a Moscovite inspired station. It has twin towers and a big clock tower in the center and is really the showpiece of North Conway Village. Uh, it's the, uh, a tremendous landmark. And also the property is beautiful in that it, it is uh, the way it was in the early 1900s with an operating turntable, 85 feet in diameter. And we use the, uh, the um, engine house the way it was um, when steam engines were operating. In fact, we have our steam engine number 7470 in stall one getting ready to come out for a, a day's use. Uh, one of the unique features of the building are the two oak staircases, one, one in the gift shop to the uh, tower upstairs on that end and one to the business office. And they were meticulously stripped with toothbrushes and stripper uh, to get them back to their original finish. They're quite unique, irreplaceable. The trains roll through beautiful bluffs and steep ravines. The panoramic mountain vistas are breathtaking. You can take a quick family trip or a day-long rail fan excursion. You'll be pulled through history by either historic steam or electric diesel. And let me tell you, these are trips that can be taken in style. The comfortable coach seating is not your only option. Check out the spacious first-class seating aboard the beautifully restored Gertrude Emma Pullman Parlor Observation Car. The Pullman Parlor Car, the Gertrude Emma, um, was purchased, came to the railroad in about 1985 and was fully restored. It was built originally in 1898, so it is over 102 years old. We operated on our valley train, and what we've done is uh, we've kept it restored the way it is. It has a lot of the original mahogany inlaid interior in it. We have a nice carpeted interior and wicker chair. So the, the way that that car is used now is for a nice relaxing ride, sort of the way the car was used originally when it operated between Chicago and New York um, on the uh, Pennsylvania Limited. And uh, people would sit in the parlor together, have a drink or two, and then of course they had their staterooms to spend the night. The staterooms are no longer a part of the car. They were taken out of the car many, many years ago but it gives you that feel of an old time train and what, what uh, railroading was really like in the heyday of the Passioneer Railroad excursion trains. The car originally had a bedroom where every small window was and each was done in a different wood. There was rosewood, oak wood, and each room had a name and then there was a common area to the rear of the car where the uh, observation platform is. Uh, the car over Several restorations and upgrades has been brought to where it is today. You can also relive the golden days of railroad dining as you travel aboard an elegant dining car. The dining car Chikora was uh, a relic in 1992, and we decided to totally gut that car, refurbish it, and turn it into a, a, a full service dining car. If you're going to travel, you might as well travel in style. And if you're going to travel in style, what better place to do it than in beautiful New Hampshire? We've reached the end of the line for this edition. We hope you've enjoyed the ride. We'll have more layouts, prototypes, and how-to tips next time. And more fun with the world's greatest hobby in the Dream, Plan, Build video series. Welcome to the Dream Plan Build video series. 
In this collection, you'll see amazing layouts of fellow modelers, some of the most interesting trains and railroads around, and plenty of tips and techniques to make your time at the workbench and at the throttle more productive and a lot more fun. We'll travel across America in search of layouts we all dream of operating and get inside the heads of their builders as they describe how they designed and built their prized railroads. Plus, whether you're running a 4x8 or a 40x80 operation, you'll discover tips and techniques to make your rolling stock run smoother and look more realistic.